wow. Okay, I really want to get him on for a long time because he knows so much about what's going on. And he is the best-selling author uh, of Breaking Rank, a top cop's expose of the dark side of American policing. And he was the police chief during the WTO conference and all of that that happened. He's with Cops Say, LegalizedDrugs.com, and also Normal. And uh, again, uh, Norm Stamper, Chief, good to have you on with us. What do you think of the way policing's changed overall in this country? Uh, I'm troubled by it, deeply troubled by it, as a matter of fact. I think in the wake of 9-11 and also because of the, the impetus or, or the thrust of the drug war, we have police officers becoming less and less attuned to their own neighborhoods and communities. Uh, and, and, uh, and quite frankly, I think what we've seen is vastly increased militarization of American police forces, which puts uh, civil liberties at risk, which puts community uh, health and safety at risk as well. Is there any way to reverse this? It seems like uh, even establishment folks are starting to get concerned, or will we just be like a third world country now? You know, I hope there's a way to reverse it. I believe, I always believe that there's a way to reverse it. Uh, this is a function, I think, of the people deciding what kind of policing they want, because that's pretty much the kind of policing they're going to get. And I, and I really do believe that, that uh, with the uh, aftermath of 9-11, the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, DEA, uh, throwing money and equipment at local law enforcement, uh, we find even tiny rural uh, police departments with uh, large SWAT uh, contingencies, and, and, or contingents, I should say, and, uh, and we're finding uh, no reluctance on the part of Homeland Security to provide uh, military-grade equipment uh, it, 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 to, to the tiniest of departments. An AP reporter called me a couple of weeks ago, one of my reactions to uh, a, a couple of examples, one in Georgia, the other uh, in Texas. And uh, one was a three-person police department, the other was a one-person police department, meaning that one person was supposed to the be cop, the detective, and the police chief. And... Um, in the former case, $4 million in recent years granted to that uh, Georgia department, $3 million to the tiny uh, Texas department. There's something wrong with that picture. Well, there certainly is. Uh, I want to get into the whole uh, situation with, with, with decriminalization and why you support that, Chief. Sure. Uh, but, but first off, obviously, I've got to bring this up. What happened at the WTO? Was that taken away from you by the Delta Force? And obviously there were provocateurs in the crowd. A lot of police complained that they weren't allowed to go after them. Some of them got housed at that building after, but then the peaceful protesters got attacked. What happened there? What was what was going on now in hindsight with that, sir? Well, the long and the short of it is that we thought we were prepared, and we weren't. Uh, we thought we were ready. We thought we were smarter uh, than the anarchists. And uh, it turns out, at least in terms of the tactics uh, employed, uh, we simply were not up to it. Uh, it's a small city, uh, comparatively speaking, about 530,000 at that time, uh, with a small police force in a small state, a small county for that matter. And uh, it, the mayor disagreed with me, but I don't think that uh, that conference, the World Trade Organization, should have been held in Seattle at all. But that's another issue. That's a, a much larger political issue. But uh, I, I will tell you that uh, looking back on it, I made the biggest mistake of my career uh, during that week, and it now constitutes my legacy in the minds of many people. Uh, we, we were accused on day one of underreacting, on day two of overreacting. And I think the, 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 uh, the, the, the point is that if you've got uh, a very small police force, you've got to make sure that these kinds of events, uh, anything that's got uh, world, international, trade, finance, monetary in its title, uh, should be held in much larger areas with much larger police forces. To, sure, to sure. Let me tell you a brief story, and then I can play a clip and then move on to why you're really here today. Sure. My reporter, Rob Dew, won a lawsuit. I'm not going to, we can't get into details about it, with uh, Pittsburgh. He wasn't part of the protest. I sent a three-man team. He's on a hill. The conference is over. There's college kids out of the park. The police come. Multi-jurisdictions all over the country attack everybody. 
under command of the security of the WTO or, or, uh, or, or the G20 in that case. Right. They were running it. He's up on a hill with mainstream media filming it. They come, they check mainstream media, they go, you're free to go. They arrest him and then brutalize him and don't even care it's on tape. And then he wins a lawsuit. How, what type of, where does that come from? Where they, we have video of girls on bikes at the university, not even part of anything, being hit and knocked off their bike. And then the cop hits her in the head, assault with a deadly weapon for no reason. What is going on when we see these images uh, of uh, what's happening to the culture? I think, I think what's happening is that the police in becoming increasingly militarized uh, over the years uh, have seen the people as their enemy, uh, have, in fact, in the name of public safety, uh, violated uh, civil liberties and constitutional rights of their fellow Americans. In short, they have abused the people they've been hired to protect and serve. Uh, this is certainly not all cops. It's not all police departments at all times. But it's been a very disturbing trend, and it needs to get reversed. I want to play you a clip uh, from Seattle and then get your final points on that and then shift gears in the drug war, which obviously this all, in my view, the militarization began with. We'll see if you agree with that in a moment. But here is a clip from my film, Police State 2, uh, The Takeover from Seattle, just to remind people of what happened. Here it is. Your conduct is in violation of state and city law. And your failure to leave the area now will subject you to arrest for failure to disperse. Are you part of an organized protest today? Um, no, I'll tell you again, you need to leave the body Not only could you not say what's on your mind, you couldn't wear it. What? Give me that. Give me that. Oh, yeah. Sir, what? sir, sir, let's not get into a big scuffle over here. Okay. This man had an anti-WTO sticker on his backpack. He took it off my... Right. Okay. This okay. Is, you're, you're there are no protests down, protest down, down here. No protests. You saw what happened yesterday to your city. We're not going to let it happen again, okay? Not allowed to happen. Not here. It's a no protest zone, sir. He came moot. You just took his body? Am I right? He did. He reached onto his body and pulled it right off. I asked if I could go through. He said, I couldn't if I had a button. And I wasn't going through the line. And then he ripped it off my jacket. Now, if I say I'm protesting WTO, I can't go in. If my T-shirt said I supported the WTO, could I go in? That's not a protest. It's a no protest zone. Hence, no protest. Backpacks and bags were also searched for banners or gas masks. The gas masks are illegal to possess today in the city of Seattle. How can you guys mandate something like that? What's that? I'm curious, how can you mandate something like that? Because they declared the city a state of emergency. But you don't know what thoughts are in my head, right? I have no idea. Well, are, you are, you, are you protesting? There's no protest on down there. You go down there and protest, you risk arrest. Okay? I'm just telling you that. You understand Understood. that? Understood. Okay. What country is this? It's what a situation is that is clearly uncomfortable for those who want to get through to protest and those who block their way. What we're trying to do is keep protesters out and the business people and citizens go in, okay? City leaders believe the free speech of yesterday came at too high a cost. That's why, at least for today, the First Amendment ended. And now with Facebook, they can look and see, oh, you believe this or that. You can't go into the city uh, center uh, or all this giant area, it's thought crime. That's where this is all going. Norm, I want to ask you, was that the federal people that told you to do that? And, and, and what was your liaisoning with Delta Force? Uh, the, the, the answer to your question, Alex, is no. Uh, the city of Seattle uh, was responsible for this. We had spent 11 months in planning and preparation. We, of course, had liaison with the uh, Secret Service because... Clinton was coming to town uh, to address the WTO, uh, as was uh, Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State and the, and the, and the country's chief uh, trade negotiator. Uh, and, and so we, we had a lot of federal dignitaries coming to town. Uh, but I will tell you that this was, was a city and state operation, uh, and, and, and it was not our finest hour, to say the least. Uh, we, we I only bring it up because what we see there now is the norm all over the place. And, and I just yeah. read and I talked to some police officers off record. They said Delta Force was basically in charge. Uh, do, I mean, uh, were you told not to talk about Delta Force? Absolutely not. Uh, I, you know, I can, I can appreciate people speculating about what went wrong, how it went wrong, 
who is responsible for it, but you are talking to the guy who is responsible for it. Sure, but I mean, so so what was Delta Force doing? And I and I have not until this moment heard about Delta Force in conjunction with the WTO. Uh, you, that means you can either paint me as naive or as somebody who's giving you honest answers to who was responsible for what went on that week. Sure, sure, I understand, but the feds would tell you what they wanted and then you would try to work with them? Well, the feds basically said we want to make sure that... Uh, that from the moment uh, wheels are down at CTAC, the president is safe. Uh, and so we obviously did everything in our power to make sure that we didn't uh, uh, have any kind of compromise with the president. Sure, sure, uh, sure. Well, listen, I really I got you on about the drug decriminalization. I just had to ask those questions. We really appreciate you, oh, sir. Good question. Excellent questions. And it's very painful uh, to listen to what you just played for me. It just uh, it brings it all back. I'm sorry to do that. I just want uh, so I mean, no, it's, it's good. It's good that you did. It's good that you did it. It's good that we all uh, really talk about what's happening in this country, and and it is to me very disturbing. So, if you had it all over to do again, you you don't think we should uh, ban uh, people uh, for having buttons inside their bags? You know, uh, that's about as un-American as anything I can imagine. Uh, we created an, uh, what the uh, protesters and everyone else under the sun called a no-protest zone. We just called it a curfew area. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it is shades of Kurt Vonnegut. It's, it's uh, shades of George Orwell. I mean, the language that we were using, uh, we, we embraced. We thought, well, we need a curfew. Uh, we need a, a zone uh, in which, uh, because of the violence that had erupted, uh, principally the the, uh, the result of the anarchists, but also some of our own actions, uh, we needed to do this. And on reflection, we did not need to do it. And, sure. Uh, you know, I'll live with that mistake for the rest of my life. Well, uh, wow. We really appreciate your work uh, for trying to keep this a free country, and, and especially hearing it from your... Uh, well-experienced, educated perspective. Again, we have the former police chief of Seattle uh, joining us right now. We're also going to talk some about his book. Uh, Norm, let's get into, though, the drug war. I mean, more drugs than ever, uh, more police state than ever. What do we do about the drug war? Well, we end it. We end it yesterday. We never should have started it. Uh, it was uh, destined to fail. And it has, in fact, over the past 40 years, been a colossal failure. It has been an obscenely expensive war, $1.3 trillion spent since uh, Richard Nixon famously uh, declared drugs public enemy number one and declared all-out war on them. What do we have to show for it? Well, in addition to the literally tens of millions of Americans who have been incarcerated for nonviolent drug offenses over the last uh, 40 years, drugs are more readily available today at lower prices and higher levels of potency than, than when Nixon declared this war. Uh, every president since him has signed on to the war. Every one of them uh, has, you know, statements of the present uh, administration notwithstanding, every one of them has just as vigorously as the previous uh, president uh, prosecuted this war. And it has been terribly damage, uh, damaging to the entire country, to our economy, to quality of life, to neighborhood safety. Uh, it has fomented uh, uh, unprecedented levels of violence in Mexico and, and throughout the world. Uh, and we're the four-star general, Alex, in this, this war on drugs. It, it is time for us to uh, acknowledge the huge mistake we made and end it, replace Prohibition, which is a corrupt and bankrupt model, can never work, never has, never will, replace that prohibition with a regulatory model. Uh, you know, a wide variety of, of ways to approach regulation, but something akin to what we did with alcohol seems to me to make the most sense. Absolutely. I mean, alcohol kills far more people than even the scourge of uh, drug abuse. And these people really are victims that have a disease why are we throwing them in jail or just casual users of marijuana obama promised he was going to you know leave everybody alone from what i've read he's done triple the raids on the dispensaries that bush did but i guess he has left cover i think it's disgusting i i think it's disgusting too uh you're probably aware that 
Uh, my uh, successor in Seattle was Gil Kurlikowski, who is now the Obama administration yes. drug czar. Uh, and, and that's two ex-chiefs out of Seattle who could not be further apart on their views about the drug war. You know, it's funny. I read about how they keep nonviolent people longer than violent. I guess nonviolent do make good prisoners. The private prisons make money. Uh, I, I see where these private prisons are getting laws passed to guarantee occupancy. This is a really dangerous scenario. I think it's unconscionable. I think it's immoral and, and, and uh, arguably unconstitutional and illegal. If you think about it, every time a private corporation builds a prison, builds a cell, they need to fill that cell. You know, Norm, I know you only had 20 minutes with us. Can you do 5, 10 more to finish your point on the side of the break? I sure can. Right, because we got you a little bit late and had a technical problem. Thank you so much. We'll see if we can get him back up on Skype as well. Uh, Norm Stamper on with us. I, I couldn't agree with this guy more on uh, the whole police state and drug prohibition. We'll be right back to get his comments on that and then your phone calls. I had tried everything. I'd cut back the amount of food I was eating. I was lifting weights and jogging, but nothing was working. My body was literally starving for minerals and trace elements as well as key vitamins. And as soon as I had that, I immediately could eat half of what I was eating previously and be satisfied. Now, there are hundreds of great products at InfoWarsTeam.com, but I want to point out the three that have helped me lose 37 pounds in just two months. Products like Beyond Tangy Tangerine, Pollen Burst, and Rebound. When I started taking the Tangy Tangerine and other products every day, I lost more than 37 pounds in just two months. Now that's results. I want to challenge my listeners to go to InfoWarsTeam.com and to order just three of their products, and you will see the changes in the way you look, feel, and in your appetite almost immediately. Start your journey to health and wellness today. InfoWarsTeam.com. The drug war has been a great success for the defense contractors. It's been a great success for the federal government expanding its power. It's been a great success for bureaucracy, but it has been an absolute nightmare for this country. We consume more drugs than any other nation on earth. You look at the statistics, it is just dumbfounding. And if you look at free market, it's because we have drugs illegal. Uh, and I'm gonna go back to the former police chief of Seattle, Norm Stamper, but if you study, and I wanna get his take on this and finish his points he was trying to get to about the prisons. If you look at how the British took over and then colonized China, took them about 100 years, but China made opium illegal, and so then that created a huge black market, and the British, first few decades, took over the port towns, bought off the police, because there's incredible money, bought off the local constabularies. Within less than 100 years, they had the whole country broke it in, 10 and then 12 parts and the, the, the different Western powers ran China for hundreds of years and ran it into the ground. And, 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 it's, in, and it's the big reason it's the mess it is today in many respects. I've studied the history, fascinating history. And the, the, Nixon and the rest of the black ops commanders knew full well what the drug war was going to do. That's my piece in the seven, eight minutes we've got left with Norm Stamper. Norm, you've got the floor. I'm going to try to shut up here and let you... Uh, get into why you, as a former police chief that has witnessed this and the statistics, the numbers, the prisons, what's really behind this drug war? What do we do about it? Finish your point about the prisons. Well, you know, in a word, fear is, is behind the drug war. And I, I speak specifically of the fear of elected officials, of our politicians, to really confront this issue the way it deserves to be confronted. Uh, politicians don't want to be seen as weak on crime. They don't want to be seen as weak on drugs. They certainly don't want to be seen as condoning drug use. None of us in law enforcement against prohibition, I want to get that plug in, uh, is of, of the opinion that anyone should be taking any particular kinds of drugs, including alcohol and tobacco and, and the like. But we all know that people are, in fact, going to use drugs. Uh, of a wide variety of forms. So the question that we face, I think, as a society is, do we want these private prisons, for example, just to cite one segment of the population invested in continuing the drug war? To build these prisons, to fill these cells, and to, in the process, make enormous profits housing nonviolent offenders who are far better off 
uh, treated in those case, in those instances where they've got an addiction problem for that addiction and allowed to stay in their homes, in their neighborhoods, in their communities. Now, we talk about the breakup of the nuclear family. We've done this for decades uh, in the African-American community. Well, for God's sakes, it's a drug war that has produced the lion's share of that particular problem. So we have a public policy that doesn't work. And, and we have people who have a responsibility for dealing with that who are just altogether too timid to do the right thing. Getting back to Obama's role, I mean, he didn't keep any of his promises, but that was one thing five, six years ago. I thought, well, at least there's no way he's going to lie about decriminalizing marijuana. Uh, he, he must be telling the truth. That's a good thing. And he's been, uh, as the New York Times reported, tripled the drug raids in the 15 states that have decriminalized and more raids. I mean, here's articles right here. DEA raids multiple marijuana dispensaries in Washington state where you're from, where you were police chief. Uh, I mean, is there any end to this? And uh, how does Obama get away with this? Well, I, you know, I, I, I come back to this notion that uh, politicians can, uh, tie themselves up and not can become paralyzed by unfounded fears. Their constituents are way out ahead of them. Uh, the polling shows that the vast majority of the American people uh, con have concluded that the drug war has been a failure. The majority of the American people believe that marijuana should be legalized today. Two states, Washington and Colorado, uh, have in fact legalized uh, adult use of small quantities of marijuana. So here come can't the feds. Shit to a kid, you can't drive under its influence, can't rob a bank and try to excuse yourself because you're under its influence. You still got to behave responsibly, but making a choice about what you elect to put into your own body that harms no one else uh, really should be reserved for the individual and not the government. What about the state's rights issue with Washington and Colorado being raided by the feds on a weekly basis when the states have decriminalized the marijuana? You know, we, we've gone beyond decriminalization. We have legalized Colorado and Washington. That's right. Yeah, We have legalized, but the federal government trumps state law on uh, marijuana. Uh, years ago, uh, Congress classified it as a Schedule I drug, which is an absurdity. But in so doing, they basically gave the federal government jurisdiction over marijuana enforcement. Now, so far, we have not seen the federal government move into either of these states uh, to, you know, to do what they theoretically legally could do, and that is upend our laws altogether. I think if they did that, they'd be making a huge political and strategic mistake. Uh, but in the end, I think we need to send a message to Congress that uh, marijuana needs to be rescheduled. And the states, uh, apropos of your uh, comments, uh, the states need to be given the freedom to make their own laws along these lines. Sure. Why do we even have states if they can't do things like decriminalize or legalize marijuana? And, sure. and I understand they call it legalization, but there's still regulations. There's still laws. There's taxes, there's control. I just call that decriminalization. You can call it legalization, but. Well, and, and in fact, Alex, I, the, the, the distinction is important because you see, if you don't legalize it, if you merely decriminalize it, uh, it makes it an infraction. You're not gonna go to jail behind a marijuana charge, a simple possession charge, but you are still considered a violator. Ah. So the product itself continues to be illicit. And as long as it's illicit, obscene profits will be made as a result of that classification. Exactly. I mean, look at what the drug war's done to Mexico. It's a completely oh, failed state. Can you give us your expert opinion on that? I certainly can. I, I grew up in San Diego, a border town. I spent a lot of my earlier years in Mexico. And uh, it's just heartbreaking what has happened in that country. The levels of violence, upwards of 70 thousand homicides since 2006. Wow. All attributable to U.S. demand. A big portion of that, uh, of those deaths and of the profits uh, of the cartels is traceable to marijuana trafficking.
Yeah, when I was a child, we went to Mexico like three times a year. It's just a jewel. And we'd go into the mountains in the north. We'd go down oh, to, yeah. to, to, to to Chichen Itza in the south, Yucatan, all over. We didn't go to Mexico City. It was bad then. But now I, I've been, you can't go anywhere in Mexico now, even the controlled areas where it hasn't collapsed to a certain extent. Very sad. It's, 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 it's tragic, and we are the proximate cause. Uh, I want to get a little bit into your book and any other points you think are important to make, and I hope we can have you back again because I think this is just an amazing interview. I hope that everybody will get involved and go to CopsSayLegalizedDrugs.com, but I wanted to raise this point to you. I'm seeing the sanity movement really gain ground with libertarians, conservatives, you know, of course, liberals, but really grow. Where even 10 years ago, most of the police I talked to in Texas were like, you can't legalize that. Now all the cops I talk to know that this is a total failure, know it's destroying the society, know it's been an excuse to militarize police. And uh, I mean, I, I know very few pol uh, police that aren't corrupt and aren't making money off of it uh, who, and who aren't part of the narcotics teams. Uh, who 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 aren't for decriminalization or legalization? And, and as you said, the polls show that. So here's my question: What's going to happen if they if they keep fighting this for another decade, where every cop on the force at one time or another has smoked marijuana, or everybody knows it's nothing compared to alcohol? And I'm not a pot guy. I mean, I I like alcohol more, and I think it's actually pretty destructive. Uh, I mean, what's going to happen in this in this hypocrisy where we all know? that it's just a way to have the government run our lives and, and for corrupt drug dealers to make money. I mean, how long can this fraud go on, police chief? Well, you know, we could, I guess getting into another vice, we could take bets on how long it's gonna go on. Uh, yeah. my, theory, my theory is hypocrisy uh, crashes of its own weight uh, eventually. The way to speed up that eventuality is for people to become organized, mobilized, agitated, educated, and to make their views known. One of the most encouraging uh, trends that I'm, maybe I'm, it's wishful thinking, but I am detecting is liberals, conservatives, libertarians coming together to appreciate that there is nothing uh, 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 socially worthy of, of a continuation of our drug war, that it's done altogether too much damage and it's time for us to unite to end that war absolutely uh, if you had to take bets on it i think it's going to be i think in the next five to seven years i think it'll totally collapse but then what are the big banks going to do that are busy laundering the proceeds across the board well you've got you've got money laundering you've got the private prisons you've got the uh, drug enforcement industry these are all uh, influences and forces in our society and the structure of our economy who are tied to these profits uh, they're going to have to use their imagination. They're going to have to buck up and uh, re recognize the the value that will come from from ending the drug war. And I personally believe that is going to happen, whether they're uh, forced to come to that conclusion or or they uh, simply muster the spine and the honesty to say, "I've known for a long time that this is foolish." Absolutely. Uh, a few minutes, then we'll let you go. I know you're a busy man. Former uh, Seattle Police Chief Norm Stamper, one of the most famous police chief really in America. You can't normally know the names of any of the others. We, you know Daryl Gates, you know Norm Stamper. You don't know really uh, uh, many others. And we have the awesome police chief on routinely, Arde Saveda. Uh, but expanding uh, uh, on this, Norm, your book, I, I was mailed two or three, four years ago, whenever it came out. I was mailed a magazine that had an excerpt of it and thought, wow, and read part of it on air. I meant to get the book and read it. I don't normally put plugs out for books I haven't read, but it seems like it had a lot of really good knowledge. I know it sent shockwaves through law enforcement, and a lot of police chiefs responded for or con. Uh, but breaking rank, a top cop's expose of the dark side of American policing. Spend a few minutes plugging your book and uh, crystallizing, crystallizing what the dark side is. Well, the dark side for me is all those isms that we hear about that can be reduced to, to arrogance or to bigotry uh, and the tendency to continue doing things that we know are failed policies. Uh, and that, that runs a pretty good gamut. Uh, our approach, for example, to domestic violence. I personally believe that violence in the home 
is a precursor to pretty much all other forms of violence. Uh, the drug war I've, I've, I've mentioned, we've talked about at some length. I think we also need to take a look at uh, the increased militarization, irrespective of the drug war, uh, that finds its way into the policies and the procedures and the practices. The police response, for example, to the Occupy movement uh, uh, produced a number of very disturbing images. And I'm thinking, you have to police these uh, events. You certainly have to ensure for the public safety of everyone. But when we, when we overreact to these situations, we essentially render ourselves, I, th I think, un-American. Uh, I also believe very strongly that we, we need to look at uh, other so-called victimless crimes uh, at consensual uh, behavior between adults that harms no one uh, and, and that uh, winds up being subject to American criminal justice laws and, and the criminal justice system. So it's it's uh, it's a it's a book with thirty different chapters and thirty different topics, each each one at least marginally different from the previous yeah. and the following. Well, I want to read it, and of course, you have your own site. You haven't plugged. It's normstamper.com. I do. I do. All right. Well, uh, I, we really appreciate your time today, and and I totally agree with you on the uh, whole uh, drug war. I mean, it's it's not even agreeing; it's just an admitted fact. Even the Mexican government's saying they're going to have to decriminalize, even though they yes. love laundering yes. the money, they love being paid off. They're not going to have a civilization if they don't stop this. And I really see us going the direction of Mexico if we don't turn it around. Any, uh, and I appreciate your courage to say that the Seattle thing was wrong. And uh, in hindsight, you don't hear that from a lot of folks, but that's. That's the mark of a real, real humanitarian. Any other tidbits of police chief you'd like, the former police chief of Seattle, you'd like to add for folks? Yeah, community policing. I, I think it, uh, it, there was a chance back in the 90s that we would actually see some small number of police departments embrace what I consider to be authentic community policing. And that is the community policing itself with help. A lot of help from the police naturally, but other organizations as well. Uh, we used to say popularly, uh, you, the community, you need to be our eyes and ears. Well, I think it's time for us to turn that on its head and say uh, with one voice or as, as, as many voices as we can pool together to our local law enforcement, you are our eyes and ears. Uh, I was, was on another program yesterday with a woman who had a man who was stalking her and perhaps even some of her neighbors. She went around to every single one of the neighbors and, with a photograph of this guy and said, do you know him? Does he cause you discomfort? So on and so forth. Uh, and they did talk to their police, their local police. This happened to be in L.A. And they got advice. They got counsel from the police about what to do and what not to do. You know, ways to avoid a, a George Zimmer, Zimmerman, uh, Trayvon Martin incident uh, by, by, the, by the community becoming organized and, and mobilized and making decisions about how they want to achieve public safety in their own neighborhoods. Well, exactly, because when you have the police militarized, it turns into an occupying army. They then have an attitude that they don't like you, you don't like them. That creates the division the authoritarian forces want in this country. And then I see fake community policing that just becomes secret police stuff versus police really assigned to an area where there's humanity and you know them, and so everybody treats each other like humans. That's exactly it. That's 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 my dream for policing. Well, that that sounds like almost like the old fashioned thing. I mean, just yeah, it's you know sometimes I, I myself included, we get romantic about the old B cop days, but there was so much to recommend it. You knew the B cop. The B cop knew you. Uh, would know if there was anything uh, suspicious in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, I think the community needs to take a much more active role. Uh, in its own health and safety and well-being. Wow! But the police are a, a part of that partnership, and it need, you know an authentic partnership is fifty-fifty, right? Absolutely, <laughs> so Norm if Stamper. If a senior partner, it's the community. NormStamper.com. Norm, hope you'll come back. Thank you so much. I would love to. Thank you, Alex. All right, there he goes. All right, folks. Final segment coming up. I'll jam some calls in, and uh, that was a really good interview. Glad that that uh, happened here today. Great job to the crew as well. Stay with us.
You know why I like getting guests on? They bring different perspectives. And for me, it's important to settle down because I don't get into maniac mode when I got a former police chief on. Uh, I mean, I do just sometimes just rant for hours on air. And, I, and I've got so much news I wanted to get to. I covered a lot of it. I may just go to a segment of the nightly news tonight to get to the rest of this. I just can't believe the House rejected a bid. And, and, and even the, the, the bill they had was just, just a whitewash of, of illegal spying. They won't even do that. <laughs> and it's just going to get worse, folks. <laughs> so if you drink lard every day by the gallon, you're going to have a heart attack. You know, it may take a while, but it's going to happen. I mean, we know where this goes. No checks and balances. Criminals will take over. And it's just getting worse and worse. And I, I just want to have a future for my children. And I tell you, you know, I don't use illegal drugs, ladies and gentlemen. I don't even use prescription drugs. Uh, and I just, I know we've got to decriminalize. And it just creates this big excuse to get in our lives. And the government and criminal interests bring the drugs in. I mean, that's on record, too. I mean, it's just all a big joke being gamed. Let's go to Eric in Canada. Thanks for holding her on the air. Hey, uh, I heard uh, today that Adam Kokesh's bail is paid, so he should be out soon, and hopefully you can talk to him. Yeah, no, uh, I've talked to Adam a bunch of times out of jail, but, the, but it's, they're hanging up on him. He calls me, and then it hangs up, and then his people call and go, well, are you hanging up? And then I talk to them. They three-way, then it hangs up on them. They're definitely hanging up on his phone calls. And, 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 and I've had them for hours trying to interview him and do it all. But, yes, we'll get him on. Uh, the guy, again, arrested, folks, for loading a shotgun in D.C. in defiance of the unconstitutional law that was overturned five years ago, D.C. versus Heller. Um, you heard he was bailed out today? Yeah, that, that Daryl paid his bail, and he's out today. Also, uh, or well, not well, today, well, let me stop you then. Guys, they've been calling us. We've tried to get him on to his recording. He said he'd give us the first interview. Let's get him on the nightly news tonight. If they want, I'll do the interview. Let, 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 let's call all their people. Good job. Sorry, sir. Go ahead. Also, I uh, hope you get on the JRE soon. I also want to know, do you think Joe Rogan is not letting everyone know that he knows more than he knows? Because I think he holds back. I think he, he knows a lot more, and he's just playing it right so he can get on TV and get paid well. Are you talking about the Joe get... Rogan podcast? Yeah. Joe has, like, given up. Because every time I'm in L.A., I'm there for, like, a day and a half, and I've got something else I've got to do, and his podcast is huge. And he kind of gets irritated when I ask him to come on, and he goes, why haven't you been on my podcast? And he's been, I go, why don't you do Skype? And I think he's starting to do that. Uh, but I want to go out and see Joe. I, I, I mean, I want to go out and be on his show. And I don't think Joe is holding back on anything. Joe used to be a lot more high strung. He's a lot more laid back now. And he tries to see all sides of things. He's more like a Zen master now. Uh, I've known him since like 1998. And uh, I mean, he does know a lot. He's the guy's super smart, obviously. Uh, and, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know what else you can say about him. He's a good friend of mine. What can I say? Do you have any comments on that? I mean, I don't, I don't think Joe's, I don't think Joe's holding back. I, I, I don't think he would be, I don't think he would be penalized. I mean, Dana White lets him say and do whatever he wants. Um, I don't know. I, I just, I just think Joe's laid back. He's, uh. You know, he, he takes that view that what's going to happen to humanity is going to happen. What else can I say? What do you have to say to that? Uh, well, he also has a new show coming on called uh, Joe Rogan Questions Everything, I think. It's on a sci-fi network. He just went to the, that big conference with Ray Kurzweil. Uh, he likes Ray Kurzweil. He well, yeah, he's uh, into life extension te the technology and, and, and all that stuff. And, I mean, if Ray Kurzweil invites me to something, I'll go to it and I'll tell him I disagree with him. But, yeah. No, I know. I was offered a show on Sci-Fi Network where they wanted to look at doing it here every day and all this stuff. I just have time to mess with it. So I'm, I'm glad Joe's doing that as well. Uh, Joe's a very talented, funny guy. Don't forget, we are the distributor of the new film exposing the history of CIA mind control, the present and the future. Very important film, State of Mind, on DVD and Blu-ray at InfoWarsStore.com. And it's your purchases that make all this possible. God bless you, the sponsors, the crew, everybody. And the good Lord above, my grandma praying for me every day. We also have Modifylon, the best uh, from the Southern Hemisphere, brown seaweed called by the natives Kombu. And the Monofilin is the best brand out there at the lowest price at InfoWars Store. 
Tangytangerine.com. Don't forget about that. And we have the Beyond Tangy Tangerine 2.0, Pollen Burst Plus, everything available discounted at InfoWarsHealth.com. So please continue to support us, and we just find the very best products at the best prices to bring you. All right, it's a win-win-win. Let's go back to your calls. Let's talk to Jared in Alabama. Jared, you're on the air. Welcome. All right, thank you, Alex. Good to talk to you. Hey, bro. Um, uh, real quick, I just wanted to, you know, well, I know you hate to hear it, but thank you for what you do, first off. And second off, um, you know, I just want to get the word out. You know, I've listened to, I'm a first-time caller. I've listened to you about three years. Um, everybody that's listening right now can make a difference. I mean, you got to take advantage of what's out there. Step up and do it. You know, small groups can make a difference. You can, you know, it's like the old uh, environmentalists used to say, you know, the think globally, act locally. And that applies in all aspects. That's right. Re Re ex exactly. Resist globally and resist locally. Because resisting locally is defeating the globalists globally. And we've done a good job of it in Alabama. You may have heard that, you know, we've strengthened gun laws. Where That's right. We've expanded gun laws. We and you've passed laws. laws against carbon taxes. You've passed laws against Agenda 21. Uh, and it's absolutely freaking the kleptocrats out. And you got to take advantage of it now. We, you know, you can start a, I've started a Facebook book, a page. I know I said it was Second Amendment, and I don't care to plug it because I'm doing fine. But my message is everybody can do it. It takes, there's power in numbers. And that, that's, the, that's the key of what I wanted to say today. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty, much, pretty much it for me. God bless you, sir. Keep it up. Yeah. The, Hollywood in, imprints this image from birth that one strong man defeats the entire enemy. There's targets of opportunity to wake people up everywhere. Defeating the globalists isn't just about fighting them. It's about empowering good people. And most people that are fighting for the new world order don't even know it. Let's go ahead and talk to Corey and Mass. Thanks for holding here on the air. How you doing, Alex? Good, brother. Thanks for holding. Hey, uh, well, I'm a local truck driver uh, based out of Pennsylvania. I'm actually up here in Massachusetts today. But the reason I call up is um, I have a local customer that I deliver to in Long Island outside of the U.S. National Cemetery. Um, on the northwest side of the cemetery, there are um, a bunch of those plastic coffins you did a story about a couple years ago. You're familiar with what I'm talking about. Yes. Uh, they had caught my attention. I've never seen them in person. And I, I, used, I would be what you used to or what you would consider a skeptic of things, which is good. By nature, we want to investigate things and believe things with our own eyes. Well, after I saw that, I put two and two together, and now I'm starting to really see the big picture. What is the name of the cemetery? We'll go to Google Earth. It's um, Long Island National Cemetery. It is um, off Pine Lawn Road in Long Island there. Good landmark to use is the 495, the Long Island Express. Well, some Pine. of those are real coffin liners, but they admit they can also be used during emergencies. But there are real mass casualty plans with the different state cemetery boards all over the country for millions of dead. We've confirmed that with the documents. And and, and those, those coffins are part of that, but they're also dual use for just regular burial liners. So then they can straw man and say we're making it up. But did you get any, uh, did, did you get any photos of that? Yeah, actually I did take a picture. Can you send it to show tips at infowars.com? Show tips at Infowars.com. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Anything else, sir? Uh, no, that was it. Now you can watch the Infowars Nightly News streaming live as it happens for free. Check it out at Infowars.com forward slash show.